Hi, and welcome to Dealing with Life. I'm Tom Baker, and I'm really thrilled that you're uh, along for the ride today. This is a show about dealing with life. We all do it. We do it every day. Whether you're dealing with worry, whether you're dealing with sickness or stress or loneliness, pain, struggle in a relationship, five o'clock itis, missing a loved one, financial problems, they all strike us at some point. It's unavoidable, and the one thing that we want to remember, I want to impress upon you that you're not dealing with it alone. There are people around you everywhere who are struggling, but most important, Jesus is here with us. He offers unspeakable peace and amazing comfort, all for simply the asking. With me in the studio today is Glenna Manning, Pastor of Discipleship at Concord United Methodist Church. Hi, Glenna. Hi, Tom. Glad to have you. Uh, we we uh, we want to talk about dealing with life, and there's so many things I know as a pastor that you deal with on a daily basis, and I, and I have so much respect for uh, clergy in general because you not only deal with your own problems, you deal with everybody else's, and I don't know how you take that home uh, with you, but we're going to talk about that. But I want to get to first, uh, in uh, dive in your past a little bit and, and have you uh, get us from way back when to now. I know you were a teacher. I was. Um, I was a um I guess I have to go back further than that. Uh, you know, I was really raised in a very uh, Christian home, uh, very steadfast parents of the faith. Um, my grandmother, I didn't realize it at the time, was uh, really mentored and sort of showed me what faith looked like because I used to watch her in her daily discipleship walk. I didn't know then that's what it was, but yeah. uh, grew up in the faith, always been active part of the church. I married. Um, and you're local, right? You're from I Knoxville. I am local, okay, yes. I, I, I grew up here in Knoxville and, um, you know, married uh, a, a man I went to high school with. We didn't date in high school, but, but I married him. He was from a very similar background, uh, you know, similar faith story. So when we married, we weren't like most um, young adults. We really never left the church. We stayed active in the church, although it was kind of hard at times to find our place. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so we actually ended up teaching a four-year-old Sunday school um, when we first were married and in the church because every other class would just seem like made of older people who had it all together. And we were still in college <laughs> and trying to figure it out. They could teach and, you more than you taught them. Exactly. Yeah. So, so, you know, uh, he's, he's been a faithful companion, you know, on this journey. And so we've, we've spent our lives, um, being involved in the church, taking active, you know, leadership roles. Um, but for my career, I chose to go into teaching my whole life. I wanted to be a teacher, um, playing school was my favorite activity growing up. All right. What, what intrigues you about teaching? I, I don't know. I think it is just, it was, it was just the gift with which I was born. A calling. I, yes. Yeah. It, I mean, it really was. Like I said, from a very early age, I never yearned to do anything else. I just wanted to be a teacher. And so, you know, I set out to do that. I thought I wanted to teach um, elementary ed, um, but I had a fantastic business teacher in high school who uh, ironically is now a member of our, is a member of our church. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I don't know, I just uh, love what she did. I've loved business. I've loved that order of business. And so uh, I actually have a, a BS uh, from UT in business administration and a master's in business education. And so that's nice. the field that I went into. And where and did you teach? I taught at uh, Oak Ridge High School. Okay. Uh, well, really an Oak Ridge school system. I taught at Jefferson for a number of years. Uh, I went home when I became a mother for seven years and then came back and spent the bulk of my career then at Oak Ridge High School. And then while I was in seminary, I taught at Run State uh, in, oh, wow. uh, in Oak Ridge. Okay. So, but as the information technology age sort of bloomed, I was sort of on the precipice of that, uh, you know, coming into it. Uh, in fact, Oak Ridge, because of its scientific community, we were one of the first schools in the state to have a T1 line. And 
to offer internet for children. And so uh, oh, my, wow. my colleagues and I authored a book for the state on uh, how to use uh, the computer in the classroom. Yeah. And, there there uh, was a time not too long ago where people go, what's that? Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. So, you know, that's kind of where my career was. And I was very happy in that. I, I worked with excellent people in an excellent school system and really just thought that that would be what I would, I would ride my red pen into the sunset one day. And yeah. that was, you know, my planning. Um, but along the way, God had a different plan and that I didn't, and it actually, um, the, the seedbed of that was years before when I was taking a Disciple One Bible study, and we were doing the spiritual gifts at the end of that. Okay. And um, a fellow, uh, or a clergywoman, she looked at me and she said, I believe you have all the gifts for ministry. I thought that was the most absurd thing I'd ever heard. <laughs> you know, I'm like, well, that, yeah, that sounds what? nice. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, good. Okay. Uh, See you later. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Well, that that's not in the cards, you know. <laughs> yeah. And. And uh, but lo and behold, um, of all times, I had cared for my dad and um, our son who'd had some difficulties. And um, my father had passed. Our, our son was finishing high school and our daughter was getting ready to start. And God just laid on my heart that I had taken care of everyone else. And now it was time to go do his work and that he would take over on wow. those things. And, you know, it's a strange thing to tell people because they're like, well, was it a voice? Was it whatever? And I, I just can just say you know i'm assured that that was my message that that was what god was calling me to do when um, you feel that call it's it's unmistakable yeah and yeah. but but i i can't say that i just jumped up from my knees and went oh boy that's what i've been waiting to hear yeah uh, there's uh, a rope dangling uh, i'm just yes. gonna grab on and go exactly you know, I, yeah, I understand that yeah so my you, you know you try to get every excuse possible to say well, that's I thought not surely right. that was you know that me had been called into ministry that just didn't sound logical to me and and by the world standards it wasn't logical because uh, i was set where i was uh you know it was, you know, career wise, I didn't have to worry about anything. Yeah. I could ride this thing out. Um, it was the biggest leap of faith that I ever took. Wow. And, um, and, you know, because for, it was perfectly wrong. Yes. And for <laughs> someone who'd grown up in the faith, that's a big thing to say because you'd think you would have taken leaps of faith all across yeah, the air. But, yeah. you know, uh, you know, but it would have happened right out of college. Yeah. Or right out, yeah exactly. Yeah. 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 And and so, you know, I actually fought that calling for about a year uh, or that school year. I began to, um, on the sly, I would write seminaries. And when the stuff would come in, I would hide it. I didn't want my husband or anybody to know I was even considering this, you know, because I thought they would say, no, I don't think so. (laughs) Are you serious? Exactly. And so, um, but, you know, God had gone before me because the day came where I had to make a decision about teaching for the, the following year. And so one day at breakfast, I told my husband, I said, you know, I just feel like I've been called to full-time ministry. And like I said, God went before me. because you my husband You had to clean up the cereal yeah. bowl because he dropped his spoon in it, right? You know what? He looked at me, and I shall never forget it. And he said, I always knew you would. Oh, Wow. And if you knew my husband, who's an engineer, who has everything organized and planned out and, you know, the retirement portfolio ready, that was sure. not in it. <laughs> and, and you know, his peace with that then brought peace to me. And just God just began to open doors and, you know, the affirmations and, uh, you know, the assurance of that. You know, and people have asked, well, did you retire from teaching? And, and I didn't. I quit. You know, I, I wasn't yeah. old. You know, I didn't, yeah. you know, wasn't old enough to retire. And uh, and my colleagues were aghast that I would, you know, take sure. such a step, you know, and do that. You're and, crazy. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, Why well, 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 leave this? Exactly. And, you know, so. Um, but it seems like when you when you do have a call and and you start at least thinking about following it, doors do open. And and circumstances happen that yeah. make it very apparent. And, you know, and it just seemed like a huge thing to do. And yet, you know, my first day in seminary, you know, I heard these incredible faith stories of people who'd given up far more than I had. I mean, my family wasn't going to go without food. I didn't take, you know, the equity out of my house to go to sure, school. Sure, sure. You know, I didn't give up my health insurance. You but know, it I was mean, a complete change. Oh, it was huge. You know, and, because, and a risk where you could, it, it could it may not work out. Right. Who knows? Well, and I had no, where the other schooling, I knew where where I was going. I was going to go and teach somewhere. Yeah. And I had a vision for what that was. This, I had no vision. I had, it was just go and do this and I'll take care of it. And, and, 
you know, there were days I was homesick because my seminary was three and a half hours away. And, um, you know, I had to leave my family in the comfort of home and really step out of my comfort zone. Yeah. And, you know, I was 49 years old when I went back to seminary. And it was, you know. Go back f- to school? Yeah, filled Go with on. young people. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, and the first day they said, we need to write a paper in this certain style. And I'm like. I don't even know what that is. And I had to go back and research that and, you know, to even get started. But for every one of those questions, where am I going to live? Uh, you know, it was the year that Katrina hit gas became scarce in traveling. Mm. Um, uh, it was there, you know, everything went before me, you know, s- someone showed me where to live, um, you know, someone, you know, gave me an affirmation on a paper just to wow. kind of reassure me that yes, this every, is where every, you belong. Every question had a check mark. Yes, yes, yeah. you know, that, and I just felt like all along God went before me. Um, and then, you know, now that I'm, you know, 10 years down the road from that, you know, to look back and think, well, actually further than that, but to just say, he just, it was like this huge puzzle. All I had to do was trust him and he fit it all together sure. in a way that I couldn't, you know, have, have done it, you know, oh, so, you know, all by myself. Tingles. Yes. Well, you know, it really was, it was really yeah. a holy, and it, like I said, it was the first time in my life where I really had to say, I, I, I don't know where I'm going or what I'm doing. It's just dark before me and I just need you to show me. Yeah. But, but in a way. That's really exciting yeah. because because you know that his way's right, right, and and if he wants you there, he'll make it work exactly. And you know what <laughs> what strikes me, I think, it, it, as long as I've known you and known that you were a teacher, it all makes sense to me, an outsider, because preaching uh, and being a, a pastor has a lot to do with teaching. Huge, you know, which is a great deal of what I do, you know, today, you know, in the life of the church. But you know, it's not just that, it's every experience I've had from caring for elderly parents, for dealing with issues with children, um, you know, being able to d- do business stuff in the life of the church, you yeah. know, I mean, every skill that I have had and every experience I've had, God has somehow used those, wow. you know, and like He was building me for this, sure. you know, and. If I had received the calling 20 years earlier, I don't know that I would have made it because I don't think I had the stamina. He hadn't prepared you yet. I didn't have the stamina, you know, at that time to do that. I I, had to have a sense of who I was and who he was in me, and I wasn't ready. Wow. And I think everyone can, if you open your eyes wide enough, can, can look at the path behind and say, this is a preparation. It ain't all pretty, mm-hmm. and it may have even at some times been painful, but it is a preparation for something wonderful right. and something that helps his kingdom right. and other people. You know, and it is, you know, and it's just, you know, and so I do appreciate that, you know, I took time, that I did, you know, really think about it, that I, you know, waited, you know, you know, biblically, you know, we are told to pray about it and wait upon the Lord. And, you know, but in our instant society, we want to just pray about it and, and instantly have the answer sure. and that I had to wait, you yeah. know, and then it's like, I knew it all along. It was going to be okay, but I had to wait. Well, you have to wait. And you also, we are in a microwave society. Mm-hmm. And if it doesn't happen this afternoon, then something's wrong. Right. Then, then we start worrying. Oh, what have we done? Oh, this is crazy. Right. Wow. What a great story. And that just, that just, that just gets us started. Yes. Glenna Manning who is pastor of discipleship at Concord United Methodist Church, uh, is, is, is my guest today. And we've got a lot to talk about because uh, we deal with life on this show. And uh, you, I think, uh, uh, deal with a lot of people's lives. And I'm, I'm so impressed with that. And I can't wait to talk about it more. Dealing with Life Today is brought to you by Malone Dentistry. So when it comes to the point where you need dental care... Even if you have a dentist, what what crosses your mind? I need somebody that is experienced, knows what they're doing, charges a fair price, and treats me right. That's what goes on through my mind anyway. Malone Dentistry, family and restorative dentistry, is where I've gone for the last 20 years. And I am so happy with the care I get there. They treat me like a member of their own family. Comprehensive dental care. Dr. Stephen Malone has one goal in mind, to provide the very best that dentistry has to offer, to preserve your teeth 
for your lifetime. They're right off Kingston Pike, off of South Peters Road, Malone Dentistry. Go to KnoxvilleSmiles.com and see all the incredible reviews. Dr. Malone is now joined with Dr. Aaron Noble and Dr. Michael Costa Jr., along with their team of 15. They are the people to go to, to trust, and to feel good about what happens inside your lips. Malone Dentistry, KnoxvilleSmiles.com. This is Dealing With Life. We'll have more with Glenna Manning in just moments. I'm Tom Baker. And I know it's going to be a lovely day. You're listening to Dealing With Life. I'm Tom Baker, author of One Dog's Faith. That's a a book about life, about worry, about trust through the eyes of my silly dog, Mango. That's available through Amazon, Cokesbury.com, and also OneDogsFaith.com. In the studio with me today uh, is Glenna Manning. And by the way, this uh, episode of Dealing With Life is brought to you by Malone Dentistry. Glenna is pastor of discipleship at Concord United Methodist Church. And one question, we, uh, it was fascinating hearing your call to ministry. And uh, I'm, so, uh, I'm so inspired by that. But um, I, I know that uh, in my case, I have zero issue. In fact, I, in fact I, I love your sermons and I love your approach, uh, your teaching approach to being a pastor. But there, I know there are some who, who have an issue with female clergy. Uh, and one thing I want to say uh, is Jesus' resurrection was first reported by Mary. Uh, and, you know, and, and there, there are a lot of important women in the Bible, so I don't understand. But that's not the deal. That's not, that's not at issue here. I, w- I want to know your uh, challenges and your, your ideas of, of being female clergy. Well, uh, it's interesting because, you know, I, I didn't, coming into it, realize that people had a problem with it because it wasn't how I was raised. Yeah. Uh, my parents um, were excellent that we were not taught prejudiced or stereotyped. My parents were equally yoked uh, in their marriage and in their care of the household. And so I didn't really grow up believing that one was superior than than the other. And when I went through uh, the candidacy process, which is required for United Methodism, um, I was asked a question about how would I respond to people who did not think women ought to be in ministry. And I was aghast because I didn't (laughs) realize people had problems with (laughs) that because I'd grown up Methodist. Uh, Methodists were probably one of the first denominations to really uh, welcome women into uh, the life of clergy. Um, in fact, while I was in seminary, we celebrated 50 years of women in ministry. So that was kind of a, you know, it was just something I grew up with. And I didn't realize really until I got into ministry that people had a problem with it. A, a funny story, a, a fellow clergywoman and I were going to um, a conference event in, in Kingsport. And we got there early and went to a local McDonald's to have a cup of coffee. And and a gentleman came and sat near us, and he said, what, what are you all doing, uh, you know, up in this area? We said, well, we're here to, you know, att- attend a conference. And my, my colleague said, uh, we're both um, clergy with the Holston Conference. Yeah. And he said, you're both pastors? And she responded, yes. And he said, well, I've never seen two before. <laughs> <laughs> So, yes, so oh, that's what was, you know, what was very funny, but, you know, on, on the sad side, um, you know, I have not, I'll, I will say I have not experienced prejudice like some of my sisters in, in ministry have some have experienced bullying and abuse and mistreatment wow. that, um, there are still uh, churches who will not even conceive of a woman being their pastor. Yeah. Um, I had an experience, uh, one of my dear friends who is an uh, African-American woman who I had known for years and years uh, was dying of cancer, and she asked me to um, 
give her eulogy at her funeral. Yeah. And of course, I said that I would. Um, and she warned me. She said, my pastor does not want you to do this. And she said, we've butted heads over it. Oh, my. But I have told him that that is what I want. Um, and so she said, I, I hope he will let you. So she did. She passed, and I showed up to, to do the service. And um, he did not want to walk with me down the aisle uh, into the funeral home. Gold. And then he began the service by saying, well... Uh, this is what she wanted, so I guess we'll just have to go with it. Well, there's a good intro for you. <laughs> exactly. I bet you felt really welcome and, then. And, you know, it, it really hurt me so much from the standpoint of, you know, here's an, a, a man that's an African-American pastor who I'm sure has experienced discrimination and prejudice, you know, in his own life, yeah. and, and that he would show that to me. I think it was just, you know, Especially hurtful, yes, you know, that, you know, that really the outside of us has no bearing on who we are in our heart. Yeah. Um, And, and, you know, and I'm like you. I mean, I I find it phenomenal that, you know, God would create half of his human race and declare that half of us cannot proclaim his name. Uh, And, you know, being a male. Yeah. Uh, which which sometimes has the word parentheses stupid inside (laughs) of it. Um, But. I totally realize that my wife is much more wise than me. She sees things I don't see. And her way, her brain is wired differently. And I respect that. Mm-hmm. And, and I listen to her. And I, and, and I cherish the things that she observes and corrects me and, 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 and beyond. And why can that not end up in the church? Right. Well, and I do think, I think we have complimentary gifts, you know, and I'm very yeah. blessed that I serve with male colleagues and, you know, and I do think, I think we are, you know, we're, we complement one another well. And I think we speak to each other, to our, you know, congregants differently. Yes. Um, you know, we speak, you know, in different ways and, you know, and we have to recognize that, um, you know, for women, uh, some, you know, even when we say God, our father, uh, they cannot go there because they have not known a loving earthly father. Uh, they've had okay. bad male experiences. They've yeah. been oppressed. They've been abused. They've been, you know, and so anything that reminds them of that male uh, sovereignty distances them from God. Um, and so sometimes I have that unique ability, you know, to bring them back and to, re- you know, help them to see that that's fallen humankind, that God is above that. Um, you know, and, you know, it's just a different tenor, you know, even to our voices and how we, I mean, my male colleagues are extremely compassionate and empathetic, yeah. you know, with people, but there's just people you identify with that's different. Sure. And um, your approach and, and your thought process right. is different. Right. Yes. And, and, you know, and, uh, you know, so I, th- I do think, you know, there is that, and I think that's why God created it's male and female. We are complementary to one another. Absolutely. And I don't think we're to be adversarial and I don't think one has to be higher than the other or lower than the other. I think we're meant to walk side by side and, when he, you know, created, he said, "I'll make you a helpmate." We're, we're to be helpmates yeah. to one another. Yeah. And the best marriages I see, that's the equal you know, yoke. Yeah. The, you yeah. Know, I think that that's what's really important. So I think that's true in ministry because, you know, you know, we are carrying on God's work in the church. You know, as his family, the church family. And yeah. So I think he needs all of us to have a voice in that. I agree. I agree. So. All right. You are pastor of discipleship. Can you define that? What does that mean? Well, I'll try to. <laughs> um, you know, it was great on a business card. <laughs> exactly. So, um, well, discipleship, you just kind of back up, you know, what does that mean to be discipled? Um, because it follows the Great Commission. He says, go there and make disciples. So, we're trying to make followers, followers of Jesus. Sure. And so, and to be followers, we have to understand, well, what was it that he taught? What was it that he, you know, left for us to do? Um, and so part of discipleship is really developing, if you take teacher vernacular, a curriculum that has scope and sequence from birth to death that leads people on their spiritual journey, realizing it's not a grade by grade journey like school is. Thank that goodness. We, yeah, <laughs> but that we, you know, we're all on a path and, you know, and sometimes it's not a straight path. Sometimes we veer off and explore this for a while and come back and, you know, and it's not a linear path because it's not like, all right, now I've learned all of that. Now I can go to this because there's too many elements 
you can't begin at Genesis and say, okay, I got that. Now I understand that because there's so much in Genesis yeah. that carries forward into to different parts. And so it's just helping people to define for themselves a plan whereby they're continually learning and growing in their relationship with Christ. Why? And, and everybody's a little unique. Yes. And, and, so, and, and so we try to have, you know, entry point for the seekers, those who have not had a relationship with Christ at all, to right. those who have spent their life in the life of the church. But, you know, you never learn all that there is to know. I, you know, I thought going to seminary, I thought, man, I'm going to have all You're this gonna knowledge. You're going to know every and, answer that you ever... And, and when I did these the seminary tours, you know, the, one of the places they take me was to the library. And I was just in awe that there were that many books and it was all theology and religion and all of these things. And I, and I came away with a great wealth of knowledge, but still felt like I could fit it in a thimble compared to everything, you know, there is to learn and so you know i do like i said i help with uh, selection of all materials that we use you know in in group studies and and classes oversee our our sunday morning uh discipleship classes um uh, you know the children in student ministries you know plan their own curriculum but it's you know we all want to see that we're on the same page teaching the basic you know issues together right and so that's kind of what you know uh we want to be like the doctor we want to first do no harm you know we want to you (laughs) know don't take somebody backwards yes Yes. and so we want to teach about a god of love and let's begin with the god of love and and go on from there and so i mean the, the whole process on one side of the coin is tremendously simple. Mm-hmm. God loves us. Right. Jesus is is our savior. And on the other side it's just it just on and on it just unfolds through your life. Right. And and that's hard to to balance but well but, and you know we can buy that as long as we're not around other people but you know it's like then we get, then we get out in the world and it's like no one else is doing this so how do i love you when you're really acting unlovable <laughs> you know so God, that's mm-hmm. funny that's so funny mm-hmm. all right uh that's uh we've got more to talk about i can't i can't wait glenna manning pastor of discipleship at concord united methodist church this is dealing with life i'm tom baker uh today's show brought to you by Malone own dentistry. Let me tell you about a friend of mine, Stephen. Uh, I've known him for 20 years. I'm proud to call him my friend, and he's also my dentist. Malone Dentistry, family and restorative uh, dentistry, they are the people that I highly suggest you talk to if you're looking for someone that treats you like a member of their family. Honesty, experience, personal care, that's important when you think about dentistry. And their main goal uh, is to minimize the extensive dentistry that you might uh, incur later to give you a healthy, vibrant smile. Dr. Stephen Malone is joined now by Dr. Aaron Noble and Dr. Michael Costa Jr., along with their team of 15. They're right off Kingston Pike on South Peters Road, and all you have to do is go to KnoxvilleSmiles.com and read just a couple of the glowing reviews, and you'll get an idea of what they're all about. They want to preserve your teeth for your lifetime. Malone Dentistry, KnoxvilleSmiles.com. This is Dealing With Life. I'm Tom Baker, and we've got more with Glenna Manning from Concord United Methodist Church in just moments. This is Dealing With Life. I'm Tom Baker, and I'm really glad you're in the room with us. Uh, Today's show brought to you by Malone Dentistry. And Glenna Manning is uh, with me. She's pastor of discipleship at Concord United Methodist Church. Thanks for being here. Really glad you are. Um, One thing that really, uh, being on the outside, watching uh, you and the other pastors at Concord Methodist, and and, and pastors in general, it, it just seems like yes, preaching is a gift, teaching is a gift, but but being able to help people with their stuff, their issues, their problems, uh, and I know that to do that, you've got to one on one with them, and and you've got to kind of put yourself in their place, and and 
that's got to be hard. How do you not take that home and, and just just sit in a corner and stare at the wall? Well, I mean, it really is about boundaries and balance. Um, you know, so the thing I have to do for myself is to see that I'm spiritually grounded. Mm, yeah. uh, you know, that that's that's the first place. I always think of like the story of, you know, on the airplane when they tell you to put on your oxygen mask before you help somebody else. Um, and so yeah. uh, for everything, you know, I, I, I have to find my spiritual groundedness and my anchor in the storm. Um, you know, and so a spiritual practice that I really began in seminary um, was uh, I was in class with a woman. And part of what we had to do was to get into small groups within about every class. And she asked one day, she said, when do you spend time alone with God? Well, we're seminary students. We're learning about God You've all the done time, that, right? you know, and, <laughs> yes. you know, and it dawned on me that I, I could spend a lot of time studying about God. But when am I going to spend time with God? Yeah. And, she, you know, and she really impressed me because she had three children at home. She was a part-time semin- seminary student. She had her own business, and um, and she helped at her local church. And I'm thinking, how do you do all that? And she said, I get up an hour before the rest of the family does. And uh, she said, I yeah. spend time journaling, reading, talking, My meditating, praying. Yeah. And, um, and so I thought, well, this is something I'm going to try. And I will just tell you, the first few times was kind of painful. You know, it's like... I got to get up early. I've got to go sit here, and I'm trying yeah, to feel. Yeah, you turned it into a stressful. Yeah, event. you yeah. know, but it become it became a check. You know, let me check this off the box. I'm going to spend time with God today. Um, but over the course of the, you know the ensuing years, that's the most precious time of my life oh, wow. is to get up and to do that, um, and it really does ground me and root me um, because you know when I come to meet with people. I mean, my my opening prayer most days is, God, show me where you're at work in the world and how can I be a part of it? Wow. And recognizing that it is not me doing the stuff. It's him doing this stuff. You're just being a tool. And, 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 you know, and so separating that I'm not there to solve everyone's problem. I can't fix everyone's problem, but I can be a safe place to talk and to um, uncover and, you know, maybe, um, you know, help them with some discernment you know, uh, about things, um, maybe some affirmation that they may need. And, and you know, probably redirect and, yes. and say, wait, God's here too. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, and I have found really that at the root of most of the issues that, you know, come into my door, they all have an element of grief. Uh, it's not necessarily death type of grief, but a grief over an unfulfilled dream, a broken relationship. A loss. Uh, yeah. You know, a loss of some kind. Yeah. You know, it's, you know a loss of income, a loss, I expected things would be different and they're not. Sure. And it's just dealing with, and so it's walking with people and helping them to label this, this is what I've lost. Now, That's sometimes half the problem. Yes. You is know, actually putting your finger on, yes. why are you upset? And you know, and how can I move forward with that? And oftentimes, like I said, it's expectation. I expected someone to do this and they didn't. Yeah. And the problem with that is you never told them that that was your expectation, that you just assumed just that there. they would do that. Yeah. And, you know, and so it's just listening, you know, to be a part of that. Um, and there are days, um, you know, particularly as we deal with illnesses of folks where it, is, it gets very heavy. Uh, I know there was a period where I did two really difficult funerals within a week uh, of one another, long passing, you know, great loss um, to our church and to the families. Um, And so it's, but, you know, for me, if I can name it, you know, that that's what it is, that it's that feeling of heaviness because I'm, you know, I do carry, uh, I, I deeply love the people that I serve. Uh, I don't think you can do ministry well if you don't. Right. Uh, but with that, it com- shows. but with that comes a cost. To I feel your pain, and you know, uh, one of the services we do every year uh, is uh, what we call a service of hope and healing, and it's for those who've had a significant loss in the year to come and have this safe place at Christmas that they can come and um, and realize that they're not feeling joyful and merry. Right. Um, but when I look, because I've walked with many of those people or know their story, and that much grief in one room, uh, you know, almost feels like I'm going to sink. But it's simply because I love these people. Yeah. Um, and so, but, but that, that in itself brings hope too. Yes. Well, you know, and and from that I take, 
because I have known that great love, of course, I feel that great loss when it's not yeah. there. And yet yeah. I wouldn't have traded the love of it for anything. You know, I mean, I could distance myself and I could just say, I'm not going to get involved in your relationship or, you know, how you feel. Right. Um, but uh, I don't think that was, that's, the you know, I'm told to love one another, you know, that, that good, that's bad, the, yeah, all of it. That's the scriptural mandate. Wow. And, you know, and so that's the other side of grief is hope because, you know, because I've seen what real love looks like. I've yeah. experienced it. I know what that is. And I know that the death here is not the end of that. Um, and so, you know, to me, you know, so it's twofold. It is, like I said, me trying to stay as spiritually grounded as I can um, in the midst, you know, and, and pastors are like anybody else. I mean, we have issues at home. We have struggles. We have our own doubts. We beat ourselves up over things we should have done and didn't do or could have done and should have done. And, yeah, you know, uh, uh, you're you know, human. Yeah. yeah. Wait a minute. Yeah, you are. Yeah. Uh, you know, all those kind of things, you know, but, um, but, you know, but just like trying as much to stay grounded as possible and then just to never lose the hope because, you know, if we've lost hope, there's nothing. And but I'll, when you reflect hope, yeah. people see it and they yeah. go, well, maybe you're right. Maybe there is something. Uh, I always think of Jesus and Peter's conversation, you know, when, when, you know, Jesus has basically told some disciples, it's going to get tough. And a lot of them left (laughs) and he turned to Peter and he goes, do you not want to go too?" And Peter said, well, where would I go? And, you know, and it's kind of like, because he's not there, we've got nothing. Oh yeah. We've got nothing. Oh wow. And so, you know, for me, it's just knowing that, you know, that, that there is that hope, you know, beyond, and, you know, and I have the advantage that somebody in the midst of something sometimes doesn't have to be able to see you will get through this because I've witnessed it time Seen and time again. And you know, sure. I mean, this is your first passing of a of a close loved one. But I've walked with, you know, dozens of people now. And I'm telling you, God, it's work, be okay. you know, I've seen God work through people, you know. I mean, I've had people fall apart in my arms and say, I cannot do this. I cannot do this. And realize, yes, you can, because yeah. I've seen it happen. Just give it time. You know, I've seen yeah. it happen, you know, and so I just have to hold them and just keep giving that, you know, you know, breathe through the next sure. five minutes sure. and then we'll and breathe through the next five, you know, you know. That in itself is definition of pastor. Yeah. You just, you, you're just there for them. Right. And, and help direct. Right. Wow. What do you see is a common issue right now? Through a lot of people coming through your door, what what's kind of a common denominator in it? Well, I, you know, I still see in people, and I think this is something that's evolved really over time, pro- probably in the last 15, 20 years, as social media and live TV and, you know, some of this has become much more prominent. I think there's an anxiousness amongst people um, because I, I, I sense they're never off, that they, you know, that they never take time away to do that, let me come back and, and see that my soul is well. There's nobody sitting on their front porch just rocking right. anymore. But you I know, don't even see any front porches anymore. Yeah, our, our children <laughs> out doing free play, you know. I mean, er, yeah. everybody's scheduled and regulated and, you know. Um, but that, you know, I think it sets up sort of a feeling of there's never enough time. You know, even in, during the holidays, they're like, well, how am I going to get all this done? You know, that's and, true. And, and I, it, I was there. And then the reality is, and I can recall uh, when, when I was young and my mother, we had very few Christmas decorations, but when she would put them out, she'd say, well, we have to put away what's sitting here in order to put out Christmas. And I think what happens at Christmas is we don't want to set anything else aside to make Just room. Just crowd it on in. Yeah, to make room for Christmas. Mm, wow. And that, that makes Christmas now holy if we set other stuff aside. Yeah. And, you know, and it's like a, more, a time of morning devotion. There's other things I could certainly do. I mean, I love to sleep, you know. I could go exercise. I could, you know, yeah. busy myself. I mean, I can start my day at home, you know, working, you know, right off the bat. Um, but you know, by setting this time aside, it gives me the strength to face everything else of the day, you know? And so I just think that people aren't turning off in order to take, to set time aside. And, and and I notice it and I do it myself, uh, uh, is the second I relax out goes the phone and out goes, uh, Instagram or, Mm -hmm. or what just, you know, and, and you're not doing anything. You're just checking other people's stuff. 
but you get so involved, it, it becomes stressful. Well, and even in checking other people's stuff, we began a comparison. Yes. Like, oh, look what they had for dinner tonight. Well, doesn't that look good? Well, you know, we just had leftovers or... I stopped or, and got or, a burger on the way home. Or, yeah. I, you know, or they're uh, so happy. How? Why am I not right. happy like that? When, when all the while, the second the camera clicked and the picture took, everybody yeah. went back to their stressful lives. Well, you know, Melissa Spolster spoke at our church and she had the comment. She said, never compare your real life with someone's Facebook life. And it's just Ooh, such that's a powerful. Yeah, it, it, it is. And because that's what we do. Yeah. We look and on the surface, it all seems happy. And so I think when we keep plugged into all this stuff we keep thinking well i'm not that and i'm you know now i'm anxious about this or that or yeah. now i've got to prove myself to the world and um <laughs> my post has got to be better than exactly their post. Yeah. you know and so i think it's just stepping back and just regaining you know a sense of who you are and a confidence you know in whose you are yeah. and that gives you the anchor in the storm well you know? one thing we've done in our family is attempt it doesn't happen every night but attempt to sit at the table and eat dinner mm-hmm. and put the phones down unless somebody maybe put a little tune on in the background or right. something and, and sometimes we even play so okay your song now your song yeah. you know put it in the background right. and still talk right and uh, man that's refreshing right that's- well you know and i'm fortunate because my children are older and you know even though we had cell phones by then, we didn't have smartphones. So basically you did make a phone phones. call, yeah. you know, yeah. imagine <laughs> that, yeah. you know. Uh, uh, how how uh, 2007. Yes, yes. <laughs> so, you know, but, you know, I did. We did make it a priority for our families that, it, you know, every night we ate together. You got that, that was just, that was our, you know, pullback from the world. And now that my children are grown out in their own nest, um, they still love to just come home and sit at the table and just talk. It's a forgotten art in some places. You know. and, and man, that's so it's so strong. Yeah. So so togetherish. Right. This is dealing with life. Man, I'm just loving this. Glenna Manning, uh, pastor of discipleship at Concord United Methodist Church. Uh, we'll talk again in just a second. I'm Tom Baker. This is dealing with life. There ain't nothing gonna steal my joy. This is Dealing With Life. I'm Tom Baker, and uh, we've had in the studio today Glenna Manning with uh, Concord United Methodist Church, the pastor of discipleship there, and we've learned a lot about your pastor. We've learned a lot about uh, pastoring in general. But uh, tell us, uh, Glenna, a little bit about what goes on, what what the haps at Concord United Methodist Church. I, I, I'm a member, and mm-hmm. I love the church it's just so exciting and growing day by day and it, it, there's energy there what what's your take what what your view of what concord well you know concord is an exciting place to, certainly to be in ministry i think we you know we 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 sort of defy some of the what the pundits might say about us we're not on a major road yet we have a a, a huge church. Um, a lot of churches are doing away with Sunday morning classes. Ours are thriving. Yes. Probably over half of our worshiping congregation attends a Sunday morning class. Which is uh, phenomenal. Yeah. We offer uh, Bible studies every day of the week except Saturday. Um, you know, places for people to, to grow and to um, learn more. We offer small groups um, for men, women, couples, um, you know, wh- whatever all, yeah, a, par- a, yeah. a part of that. Um, and, and then, you know, then we have these big celebratory moments. For example, we do a, a men's event a- annually. We do a women's event annually. Our, our men's event is February 2nd. We're excited. Bob Kessling will be coming to speak about oh, yeah. how, how to blend uh, work and faith. Uh, Melissa Spolstra, uh, an, an Abington author, a great speaker, will come and speak on March 2nd for I've the women's event. I've heard her event. She's uh-huh. tremendous. And she's going to speak about uh, spiritual stamina in a world that seems to want to drain you. So that will be be excellent uh, is coming along and then as a church we're very excited as we began last year the beginnings of a recovery ministry um, as I told you I think it's so much of our uh, the things that we deal with have an association with loss and grief uh, associated with that and I think because of that we often turn to other habits that we think will sure. ease that pain um, you dull and, it and it just makes yes. things worse yeah. so part of that is recovery but so on the other side of that we really want to be more preemptive and helping people maybe get a handle on it before it becomes that 
So we're extremely excited because this year we'll be starting our own counseling center where we'll have oh, professional awesome. um, people come in with insurance issues such as they are. Uh, it's hard for people to get the counseling services that they so need um, in family counseling and marital counseling, uh, in personal issues, um, uh, you know, relationship issues, wh- yeah. whatever, however they may manifest themselves. That's a um, real church. Yes. And so we're, we're thrilled, you know, of, uh, t- of that taking heart and taking formation. And then also just becoming more um, in, uh, intentional about taking the word out into the community. I'm ex- so excited. One of our members is taking a, a Bible study out to a, a halfway house uh, here in town. She has 35 women participating in it. Wow. She is over the top uh, herself on just the, you know, being able to do this and the thirstiness of the women to hear God's word is phenomenal. Uh, you know, so I think it's just, it's great to come in and take classes and grow personally, but I think Jesus expects us to do more with it. Um, it's not that I've got my salvation and, and Jesus and I are great. Yeah. It's all about, good. You know, uh, I always call that, you know, there, there's the, um, the vertical beam of the cross that is our relationship with him, but the horizontal beam is, do we take it out? Do we reach his Help arms out in, into the world? Yeah. Um, you know, we have a phenomenal mission program. Uh, every year we do what we call a mission blitz on Martin Luther King weekend. So on Saturday and then the following Monday, we'll be participating in 14 different projects all across Knox County. I love uh, that. Uh, you know, Last year we had 550 people participate in that, and this year we're, we're, we're going to beat that. And uh, and so, uh, it's, so it's it's not just we at church; no. we're doing church. No. It, and that is exactly you know what we want to be. We want yeah. to be uh, God truly God's hands and feet in the world. Uh, and like I said, we don't want you to show up in church because that's what you're supposed to do. But we want you to be the church. Yeah, you know, believing is. Step one, right? Attending church to learn and to grow. Step two, but yeah. but get out right. and help people and serve, and that's where you feel the spirit of God just yeah. going. This this is good stuff. And it's just the transformation of hearts that you see. You know, when people really invest themselves, God just does phenomenal things. You know, when people say, "Well, you know, that's that's just why I am. You have to accept me." And I think God says, "No, if you'll let me work within you." I can do more within you than you can possibly imagine. You don't even understand <laughs> yeah. Yeah. how how yeah. cool things can be. And so oh, just to great. see the fruits of the Spirit come out within people, you know, is just a, a joy rewarding. to watch. It, you know, it is. And then just to realize that we're not all there, but we're all working, you know, toward that. And so I always tell people, you know, well, are you are you working at it better this year than last year? You know, you, you know, and it's just watching people's walk. It's It's a... You know, in teaching, we had a thing we called the aha moment when mm-hmm. you you could just look at a student and then know they got what you were yeah. talking about. Yeah, and it's the same thing I'm finding. You know, on this faith walk, when they when they when something clicks in their Holy Spirit, you know, when that just moves in them and you see that light, you just pray. You know, you just praise God because you know you can see the acceptance and the transformation beginning. Yeah. The devil wants so bad for us Mm -hmm. not to see it Mm -hmm. and to feel that we're alone and hopeless. Mm -hmm. But when you see it, it is magic. Glenda Manning with uh, Concord United Methodist Church is a pastor of discipleship, and I'm so glad you were here. Uh, Thank you for sharing your life and your view of being a pastor. It's my honor. I appreciate it, Tom. So glad. So glad. This is Dealing With Life. I'm Tom Baker, author of One Dog's Faith, And I pray that you see God at work in your life and you act as you feel the call.